In June 2007, professional wrestler Chris Benoit murdered his wife Nancy and his son Daniel before taking his own life. It is widely regarded as one of the darkest chapters in the history of professional wrestling, and in the years since has become a lightning rod for debate and discussion. With many wondering how a seemingly mild-mannered guy like Benoit could turn around and commit one of the most horrific acts imaginable. We're going to take a look at all these explanations today, but as always, we feel in order for you to get all of the necessary context, it's important to start at the beginning. Chris Benoit first began his professional wrestling career in 1984, wrestling for the legendary Stu Hart organization Stampede Wrestling. The Hart family was essentially the first family of wrestling in Canada, and Benoit would join a long line of successful pro wrestlers who owed the start of their career to Stu Hart. Chris quickly proved himself to be a talented performer, particularly with executing complicated moves and showing off the more technical side of pro wrestling that is often overlooked. He also garnered a reputation as a staunch professional, always showing up on time, never creating any backstage drama, and being a company man above all else. Around 1986, he left Stampede and began working with New Japan Pro Wrestling. Here he met several other wrestlers who would go on to become some of the most important people in Benoit's life, including Dean Malenko and of course Eddie Guerrero. Guerrero more than anyone else would go on to become like a brother to Benoit, and the two would see their careers rise together over the following two decades. After a brief first stint in WCW, Benoit joined ECW and would bounce between it and New Japan Pro Wrestling for several years. It was in ECW that Benoit honed the in-ring personality he'd become known for the rest of his career, the Crippler. The Crippler moniker was allegedly created by Paul Heyman in the aftermath of a 1994 match between Benoit and Terry Brunk, better known by his in-ring name of Sabu. Within the opening seconds of the match, a mishap between Benoit and Sabu resulted in the latter suffering a neck injury that was initially believed to be so severe it might have paralyzed the wrestler. Backstage after the match, Benoit was so upset over the mishap that he broke down in tears. Heyman, not one to let a good gimmick go to waste, decided after he'd found out that Sabu was going to be okay that Benoit would now be known as the Crippler. Over the following years, Chris would hone this personality, billing himself as a terrifying machine of brutality, using technical and complex submissions and grapples in tandem with brute strength to create an absolutely terrifying persona. Behind the scenes, Benoit was a reserved guy who didn't speak much to anyone outside of his circle of friends. But upon returning to WCW, one particular storyline he took part in would prove to be a profound case of life imitating art. Benoit was placed into a feud with fellow wrestler Kevin Sullivan. Ironically, Benoit had been sort of a last minute replacement as the wrestler Kevin had initially been feuding with abruptly left the company due to a contract dispute. At the time, Kevin's wife Nancy played his on-screen manager slash valet who was simply named Woman. Sullivan, who had a pretty strong influence over WCW's storylines, decided to write Benoit and Nancy having an affair into their in-ring storyline. The WCW went so far to sell the affair to audiences, they would have Benoit and Nancy stay in the same hotel room together, hold hands in public, and go out on dinner dates with each other. And I'm sure most of you can see where this is going. Nancy and Chris's stage romantic affair eventually became a real one, resulting in her leaving Sullivan in 1997 and eventually marrying Benoit three years later, months after giving birth to their son Daniel. Benoit had been married twice before he got together with Nancy and had a child from each marriage. His son David was born first, with his daughter Megan born a few years and one marriage later. Having a relationship is a difficult thing to try and juggle as a pro wrestler, and for one as dedicated to his craft as Benoit, there was little room for compromise. This resulted in both of his marriages failing by the time he had met Nancy and begun their relationship. However, Nancy was no stranger to life as a professional wrestler, and at least initially, the two seemed to be a good fit for one another. 
This understandably caused a lot of bad feelings between Benoit and Sullivan. Despite this, the two still managed to work well together even if they personally hated each other. By 2000 though, Benoit had become fed up with working at WCW. The company was struggling and just barely clinging to life at this point. The last straw for Benoit was a decision by WCW management to promote Kevin Sullivan to head Booker in hopes he could jumpstart the dying promotion. This resulted in Benoit, Guerrero, and several others resigning from the company despite WCW's best efforts to keep them around. Benoit went on to join the WWE along with Guerrero, where he would spend the rest of his career. His time in the WWE offered him the greatest professional success he would have, being involved in several high-profile storylines and winning multiple titles. The peak of this being at WrestleMania 20, where Benoit and Guerrero both won world championships and celebrated in the ring together. Chris seemingly had everything going for him. He was one of the most successful pro wrestlers on the planet, he was making very good money from the WWE, and he had a wife and young son that, according to friends, meant the world to him. But Chris Benoit was not a man without his demons. And while he was every bit the consummate professional inside of the ring, his life outside of it would prove much darker. Benoit, by all accounts, was very abusive towards Nancy. Her friends and family often recalled seeing marks and bruises on her, and Nancy later confided in them that Chris would strike her and verbally abuse her in front of their young son, Daniel. This resulted in Nancy filing for divorce and getting a protective order against her husband in 2003, though she eventually dropped everything and reconciled things with Chris. Chris also struggled heavily with alcoholism, as well as steroid and prescription drug abuse. His now almost two decades working in the ring had resulted in multiple injuries, including a particularly bad neck injury that sidelined him for over a year. Benoit personally paid a very heavy price for his career, suffering several broken bones, torn ligaments, and concussions that resulted in him being on pain medication while also self-medicating with alcohol. This combination of drugs, alcohol, and a seemingly violent temper was unsurprisingly quite toxic, but as we'll see, the most insidious of all these things I just listed may very well be the thing that seemed the least harmful to Benoit at the time. Concussions. We obviously have known for a long time that brain injuries are bad, and the potential for a concussion to lead to something like brain swelling or a brain hemorrhage was a real danger in everything from professional football to professional wrestling. What was less known until recently, though, was the effect that multiple concussions, even more quote-unquote mild ones, can have on the human brain over time. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy is a progressive neurodegeneration. The most common neurodegeneration that we know about is Alzheimer's disease, but CTE is similar. The symptoms of CTE can be variable, but oftentimes it's a personality shift, a behavioral change, maybe mood changes like depression. Uh, there are things like aggression and violent behaviors, a impulsivity, a short fuse. In the early 2000s, this really wasn't understood at all. And for pro wrestlers, it wasn't a question of if you would get a concussion, so much as when you would get one and how severe it would be. Inside of the ring, Benoit was utterly fearless and did anything that was asked of him no matter how dangerous it was. The most infamous example of this, though, is likely the diving headbutt that became one of Benoit's signature moves. A move that would see Benoit climb to the top of the turnbuckle before diving onto his prone opponent and bashing his head into them. Obviously, this wasn't a literal headbutt, even a guy like Benoit wasn't that crazy, and when executed correctly, the move would result in Benoit bringing his arms underneath him at the last moment to brace his landing and generate the sound that would help sell the move. However, in the world of professional wrestling, things don't always go as planned, and there were dozens of times throughout Benoit's career where this move was botched resulting in him taking a pretty bad blow right to the head. And remember, this wasn't some kind of big finishing move either. Benoit would execute a flying headbutt in almost every single match he took part in, 
and this was on top of the everyday concussion threats that all wrestlers faced. It is estimated that Benoit suffered over 50 concussions throughout his professional career, and this is likely a conservative estimate. The accumulated effect all of these concussions had on Benoit's brain was catastrophic, though it wasn't known until well after his death just how damaging they were. For Benoit, the darkest day of his professional wrestling career came on November 13, 2005, when his longtime friend Eddie Guerrero died of a heart attack, the result of years of steroid and prescription drug abuse. Chris was absolutely devastated over Eddie's death, and many of their mutual friends such as Dean Malenko and Eddie's cousin Chavo Guerrero argue to this day that Benoit was never the same. He fell into a deep depression for the next several years and continued to abuse alcohol and prescription drugs while his very rocky marriage held on by a thread. Which brings us to June 2007. On June 18, 2007, Benoit wrestled the final match of his career on ECW against Elijah Burke. This set up a match between himself and CM Punk at the weekend's upcoming pay-per-view, Vengeance Night of Champions, where they were scheduled to fight for the ECW title. Benoit's next appearance was supposed to be Friday the 22nd at a house show, but he contacted WWE officials saying that Nancy and Daniel were suffering from food poisoning and that he was going to stay home with them instead. Chris told WWE management that he would fly into Houston the following morning and be there in time for the Saturday evening house show in Belmont, Texas. The reality in the Benoit house at the time, though, was unimaginably horrific. Benoit had murdered Nancy on the morning of June 22nd, just hours before calling the WWE and telling them she had food poisoning. At some point that morning or the night before, Benoit tied Nancy up by her hands and feet before strangling her to death with an extension cord. Benoit killed Nancy in a spare room that was being used as an office at the time. There was no sign of a struggle, leading police to theorize she may have been drugged beforehand. Afterward, he wrapped her body in a blanket, then placed a Bible next to her and shut the door. At some point the following day, Benoit also murdered his son Daniel, slipping Xanax into the child's drink, then smothering him with a pillow in his bedroom after he fell asleep. Like he had done with Nancy, Chris placed a Bible next to his son before going back out to the living room. Chris spent the rest of Saturday alone in his house. What he did the entire time is unknown. The only evidence found was Google searches on topics like the fastest way to break a neck and a specific story from the Bible involving the prophet Elijah and the resurrection of a young boy. At some point that evening, he unlocked the back door and put his two German shepherds in the yard. In the early morning hours of Sunday the 24th, he took Nancy's phone and sent a series of text messages to several of his close friends and co-workers from both of their phones. So um, we drive to Houston the next day, me and, me and Scotty, and, uh, and still no still word from, no Chris. from Chris. We're calling him, okay, nothing. I get some texts on my phone at probably 5 a.m. And I get texts from Chris. So and you it, wake up in the morning, you've got these Not texts. even before, it woke me up before oh, okay, at 5 okay. in the morning. Mm -hmm. So I look and I look at the uh, my text and I'm like, that's weird. It says, the dogs are in the enclosed pool area, the garage door is open. I looked at it, I was like, well, that's weird. Is this one of those texts you get? You know, sometimes you get texts, you know, from three days ago you never delivered, yeah, and then all of a yeah. sudden you got a text. And this is kind of the start of texting. You know, now it's a little different. But yeah, back it was then, 2007. A lot of times, you know, texts didn't come through and they got lost, and all of a sudden you got them. And I was like, what? Well, you get half a text. Half a text, yeah. yeah, that was weird. So, so okay, I, I wrote it off. Then I get another text from Nancy's phone, from his wife's phone, and it said the same thing, you know, the same text. That's really weird. Okay, whatever, uh, I kind of wrote it off. So then I had to get up in two hours, so I got up. Neither Chavo nor Chris's other co-workers elected to inform the WWE about these texts on Sunday, as they were still more concerned about protecting Benoit from being in trouble with his employer. 
The absolute last thing any of these guys thought was that Chris had done something to hurt his family. And at this point, covering for their coworker so he didn't get in trouble with management was more of a priority. And at the end of the day, it would have made little difference if they had shared the information. As shortly after sending the texts, Chris went into his home gym and hung himself using a weightlifting machine. The entire Benoit family was now dead. As the night of the pay-per-view came, WWE management tried numerous times to contact Benoit. When it became clear he wasn't going to make it in time, they replaced him in the match with another wrestler named Johnny Nitro, citing a quote-unquote family emergency as the reason for Benoit's absence. Angered by the last-minute substitution, the Houston crowd infamously started chanting, We want Benoit during the match completely unaware of what the man they were cheering for had done. By Monday morning, Chavo and Chris's other friends were now very concerned, and informed WWE management about the text messages early Monday afternoon. We didn't know anything. We still didn't know. We've been calling, been calling, been calling. So finally, I go to Johnny Ace, I go, Johnny, Johnny was the head of talent relations. Mm -hmm. I go, Johnny, this is my phone, this is what I got yesterday. And he's like, dude, with his Johnny voice, Chavo, hey, what are you talking about? Why didn't you show me this yesterday? I said, Johnny, we're trying to cover for him. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, I didn't know what was going on. We're covering for him. He's like, all right, let me get on the phone. So I guess they called the Atlanta police or whatever, and, and I don't know anything about it. I just spoke to one of the other offices there. My name is Dennis Fig, and I'm a retired detective in New York City. I run the security for World Wrestling, and one of our wrestlers that lives down there is missing. And he told me to just to say we need a welfare check done. Okay, what's the address? Uh, 130 Green Meadow Lane. The zip code is 30215. All right, Dennis, what's your last name? Fagan, F-A-G-A-N. And what's his name? Uh, Chris Benoit. It's spelled B-E-N-O-I-T. Okay, and he's a, a wrestler? Yes, he's, what, what happened, he's a very religious gentleman, and yesterday he was supposed to show up at a pay-per-view and never got on the plane, never showed up. They tried to reach his wife, Nancy. She doesn't answer. They tried to call his house. It's, unlo it's, it's out of character for him. So at 3 o'clock this morning, there was a message left for one of the other wrestlers, and basically it says uh, uh, the dogs are in the backyard, the back door is open. Goodbye. And that was it. Dogs in the yard? Yes, and the back door is open. He didn't say anything else, and that back was it. Door. That message was left at 3 o'clock this morning for another wrestler. Police arrived at the Benoit home. However, his two German shepherds had escaped the backyard and were now roaming out front. The dogs were aggressive and would not let sheriff deputies through the gate. Eventually, though, they got a hold of Benoit's next-door neighbor, a woman named Holly McFegg. Benoit's dogs knew Holly and were friendly to her, so the sheriff's office asked if she'd be willing to go inside the home to check on the family for them, which, unfortunately for Holly, she agreed to do. Within a couple minutes of entering the house, McFegg discovered the bodies and came running back out of the home screaming. The WWE was informed at 4.15 p.m. that Benoit and his entire family were deceased. However, they were not informed that early indications were pointing to a murder-suicide committed by Chris. The standard process when a wrestler passed away was, and still is, to do a memorial show. So they really didn't have a reason to treat Benoit's death any differently. Which is how we got the now infamous and very awkward Benoit tribute show. That night, Raw aired a hastily put together tribute honoring the life and career of Chris Benoit, which included interviews with Chris from a documentary the WWE had released about a year prior. The episode opened with Vince McMahon standing in an empty ring announcing Benoit's death to the legion of fans watching at home. It is eerie to go back and watch some of these heartfelt tributes from Benoit's friends knowing they had no idea just what their good friend had done. 
Raw aired at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and by this point, Fayetteville police had a pretty clear idea that it was indeed a murder-suicide, and details slowly began leaking to the press reportedly before the tribute episode of Raw had even ended. When the WWE found out, they immediately pulled the episode in regions where it was still scheduled to air, and Vince McMahon would go on to make a pre-recorded statement that would play before their other shows that week. In the aftermath of the murders, wild speculation began almost immediately as to the motive, and remains to this very day. Chris's closest friends and family simply could not believe he would have done such a thing. When his son David heard the news, he thought the person telling it to him was playing some kind of cruel joke. Across the board, all of them insisted there had to be some kind of explanation. However, Nancy's family was much less surprised, as they knew firsthand how Benoit had treated his wife in the past. The explanation her sister and many others immediately jumped to was Benoit's history of steroid abuse, beginning what would become known as the quote-unquote roid rage argument. During the 2000s, it seemed as though the world of sports and sports entertainment was being rocked by a new steroid scandal every day, and the WWE was right in the center of all this. The death of Eddie Guerrero had shed a public light onto a very large skeleton in the WWE's closet, that being almost their entire roster was abusing steroids. Guerrero's death, as well as others, brought about the creation of the WWE Wellness Program, a program designed to regularly drug test wrestlers and make sure they weren't abusing steroids. Benoit himself had passed every single drug test given to him since the program began which made things very awkward when a police search of the Benoit home turned up steroids, and a toxicology report found evidence of steroid use. So, clearly Chris knew how to skirt the WWE testing measures, but was steroids to blame for the murders? Well, as far as the national media was concerned, it was a foregone conclusion. I have to ask you both about the steroids because we did read in the toxicology report that there was evidence of steroid use. Got to the home, they found Chris Benoit's body, his wife's body, and his child's body. They also found steroids in the home, and when asked by reporters if the steroids could have played any part in the murder-suicide, the DA, Scott Ballard, said, quote, we don't know yet. This is one of the things that we'll be looking at. Like I said, this was the 2000s, and steroid scandals were all over the place, so it's understandable why they would immediately jump to this. And steroid use does affect someone's mood greatly. Nancy's sister said she'd gone through great lengths to get her husband to stop using steroids and the other medication he'd become reliant on. This included oxycodone and Xanax, which were also found in his system, though admittedly at therapeutic levels. Some claims even state Nancy was encouraging Benoit to retire from wrestling altogether, citing the toll his career had taken on his body. Benoit was able to have almost unlimited access to both steroids and pain medication thanks to his doctor, Phil Aston. Aston is a controversial figure in the Benoit story, as he would later be sentenced to federal prison for illegally dispensing medication to his patients. By all accounts, Aston was essentially a vending machine for any drug his patient wanted, including painkillers and anabolic steroids. When you combine this with Chris's alcoholism, you have a clear recipe for disaster, and it's no surprise this is something people jumped to blaming. In my opinion, though, the single thing that did the most damage to Benoit in his state of mind was concussions. In September, Benoit's father asked Dr. Julian Wales from the Sports Legacy Institute to examine his son's brain. This is when the effects of CTE were really starting to be studied for the first time, and knowing Benoit's history with in-ring injuries and concussions, Dr. Wales was curious to see if his brain had been altered in any way, and I'll just let the doctor's own findings speak for themselves. Good morning, I will. Uh, we were very fortunate to have uh, the work of Ben and Amalo, Chris Nowinski, really lead to this request. And this is a healthy brain on the left, and you see a, 
a very smooth background here. You see normal brain cells and no abnormal staining at all. Very, very consistent. Here we see a very small section of Chris's brain and you see these brown areas here against a very, very striking uh, brown background here. And all of this area is staining for damaged brain cells. These are, are dead brain cells in their connection. And how much of this did you find? It was uh, uh, extensive throughout Chris's brain. It was striking and maybe shocking in, in the extent. Another, another uh, example that you have, another contrast you have, is the brain of an Alzheimer's patient. You have said that this mimics some of the things you see in Alzheimer's patients, even in this young man. Well, well it does exactly. And here, here you see an Alzheimer's patient Again, uh, a very uh, striking uptake of the brown dye. And this is a dye that you need to, to tell this protein, which indicates the previous damage. On the left, again, Chris's brain showing these ghost of old neurons and their connections that you see here and here. So very abnormal, something you should never see in a 40-year-old. The sheer amount of damage done to his brain over years and years of traumatic impacts had turned it into a shriveled up husk of what it used to be. When it gets more severe, and it gets more severe with aging, uh, it tends to uh, spread to other parts of the nervous system. It spreads to other parts of the gray matter, it spreads to the deep nuclei of the brain, the brain stem, and it even can spread to the spinal cord. Eventually, it becomes quite a, a devastating disorder with abundant tau protein in many, many regions of the brain. I think Chris Benoit was a man who desperately needed help. And I think it is extremely unfortunate that he wasn't able to get that before he committed the actions he did. I think what continues to fascinate and frustrate people about this case so many years later is that there really isn't a satisfactory conclusion to the whole thing. We like cases where we can see a clear-cut villain. Even if that villain doesn't get brought to justice, we still have a security in the idea that we know what really happened. But the Benoit family tragedy doesn't give us that. It's just a sad story about a man who was rapidly falling apart, taking two innocent lives with him. And the question of if it could have been prevented will continue to haunt every single discussion about this case for the rest of time.